Life of Mine Part 10 Heinrich Brockhaus told me he could not help me, and I left him. I was sorely ashamed, but made a strong effort to conceal the painfulness of my situation. My other undertakings turned out equally hopeless, and after having been kept waiting for hours at Schlesinger's, listening to my employer's very trivial conversations with his callers, conversations which he seemed purposely to protract, I reappeared under the windows of my home long after dark, utterly unsuccessful. I saw Minna looking anxiously from one of the windows, half expecting my misfortune she had, in the meantime, succeeded in borrowing a small sum of our lodger and boarder, Bricks, the flute player, whom we tolerated patiently, though at some inconvenience to ourselves, as he was a good-natured fellow. So she was able to offer me at least a comfortable meal. Further help was to come to me subsequently, though at the cost of great sacrifices on my part, owing to the success of one of Donizetti's operas, La Favorita, a very poor work of the Italian maestros, but welcomed with great enthusiasm by the Parisian public, already so much degenerated. This opera, the success of which was due mainly to two lively little songs, had been acquired by Schlesinger, who had lost heavily over Halevi's last operas. Taking advantage of my helpless situation, of which he was well aware, he rushed into our rooms one morning, beaming all over with amusing good humor, called for pen and ink, and began to work out a calculation of the enormous fees which he had arranged for me. He put down La Favorita, complete arrangement for pianoforte, arrangement without words for solo, ditto for duet, complete arrangement for quartet, the same for two violins, Ditto for a cornet a piston. Total fee FRCS, 1100. Immediate advance in cash, FRCS, 500. I could see at a glance what an enormous amount of trouble this work would involve, but I did not hesitate a moment to undertake it. Curiously enough, when I brought home these 500 francs in hard shining, five franc pieces and piled them up on the table for our edification. My sister Cecilia Avenarius happened to drop in to see us. The sight of this abundance of wealth seemed to produce a good effect on her, as she had hitherto been rather chary of coming to see us, and after that we used to see rather more of her and were often invited to dine with them on Sundays. But I no longer cared for any amusements. I was so deeply impressed by my past experiences that I made up my mind to work through this humiliating, albeit profitable task, with untiring energy, as though it were a penance imposed on me for the expiation of my bygone sins. To save fuel, we limited ourselves to the use of the bedroom, making it serve as a drawing room, dining room, and study, as well as dormitory. It was only a step from my bed to my work table. To be seated at the dining table, all I had to do was to turn my chair round, and I left my seat altogether only late at night when I wanted to go to bed again. Every fourth day I allowed myself a short constitutional. This penitential process lasted almost all through the winter, and sowed the seeds of those gastric disorders which were to be more or less of a trouble to me for the rest of my life. In return for the minute and almost interminable work of correcting the score of Donizetti's opera, I managed to get 300 francs from Schlesinger as he could not get anyone else to do it. Besides this, I had to find the time to copy out the orchestra parts of my overture to Faust, which I was still hoping to hear at the conservatoire. And by the way of counteracting the depression produced by this humiliating occupation, I wrote a short story, 
Ein Pilgerfahrt zu Beethoven, a pilgrimage to Beethoven, which appeared in the Gazette Musicale under the title Un Visite a Beethoven. Schlesinger told me candidly that this little work had created quite a sensation and had been received with very marked approval. And indeed, it was actually reproduced either complete or in parts in a good many fireside journals. He persuaded me to write some more of the same kind, and in a sequel entitled Das Ende eines Musikers in Paris, Uen Musizien Etrenja a Paris, I Avenget Musif. For all the misfortunes I had had to endure, Schlesinger was not quite so pleased with this as with my first effort, but it received touching signs of approval from his poor assistant while Heinrich Heine praised it by saying that Hoffman would have been incapable of writing such a thing. Even Berlioz was touched by it, and spoke of the story very favorably in one of his articles in the journal De Debats. He also gave me signs of his sympathy, though only during a conversation, after the appearance of another of my musical articles entitled Uber die Overture, concerning overtures, mainly because I had illustrated my principle by pointing to Gluck's overture to Iphigenia in Aulis as a model for compositions of this class. Encouraged by these signs of sympathy, I felt anxious to become more intimately acquainted with Berlioz. I had been introduced to him some time previously at Schlesinger's office where we used to meet occasionally. I had presented him with with a copy of my two grenadiers, but could, however, never learn any more from him concerning what he really thought of it than the fact that as he could only strum a little on the guitar, he was unable to play the music of my composition to himself on the piano. During the previous winter, I had often heard his grand instrumental pieces played under his own direction and had been most favorably impressed by them. During that winter, 1839 to 40, he conducted three performances of his new symphony, Romeo and Juliet, at one of which I was present. All this, to be sure, was quite a new world to me, and I was desirous of gaining some unprejudiced knowledge of it. At first, the grandeur and masterly execution of the orchestral part almost overwhelmed me. It was beyond anything I could have conceived. The fantastic daring, the sharp precision with which the boldest combinations, almost tangible in their clearness, impressed me, drove back my own ideas of the poetry of music with brutal violence into the very depths of my soul. I was simply all ears for things of which till then I had never dreamt, and which I felt I must try to realize. True, I found a great deal that was empty and shallow in his Romeo and Juliet, a work that lost much by its length and form of combination. And this was the more painful to me seeing that, on the other hand, I felt overpowered by many really bewitching passages which quite overcame any objections on my part. During the same winter Berlioz produced his Sinfonie Fantastique and his Herald, Herald and Italy. I was also much impressed by these works. The musical genre pictures woven into the first-named symphony were particularly pleasing, while Harold delighted me in almost every respect. It was, however, the latest work of this wonderful master, his Trauer Symphonie für die Opfer der Julie Revolution, Grande Symphonie Funibre et Triomphale, most skillfully composed for massed military bands during the summer of 1840 for the anniversary of the obsequies of the July Heroes, and conducted by him under the column of the Place de la Bastille, which had at last thoroughly convinced me of the greatness and enterprise of this incomparable artist. But while admiring this genius, absolutely unique in his methods, I could never quite shake off a certain peculiar feeling of anxiety. 
His works left me with a sensation as of something strange, something with which I felt I should never be able to be familiar, and I was often puzzled at the strange fact that, though ravished by his compositions, I was at the same time repelled and even wearied by them. It was only much later that I succeeded in clearly grasping and solving this problem, which for years exercised such a painful spell over me. It is a fact that at that time I felt almost like a little schoolboy by the side of Berlioz. Consequently, I was really embarrassed when Schlesinger, determined to make good use of the success of my short story, told me he was anxious to produce some of my orchestral compositions at a concert arranged by the editor of the Gazette Musicale. I realized that none of my available works would in any way be suitable for such an occasion. I was not quite confident as to my Faust overture because of its Zephyr-like ending, which I presumed could only be appreciated by an audience already familiar with my methods. When, moreover, I learned that I should have only a second-rate orchestra, the Valentino from the Casino, Rue Saint-Honoré, and, moreover, that there could be only one rehearsal, my only alternative lay between declining altogether or making another trial with my Columbus Overture, the work composed in my early days at Magdeburg. I adopted the latter course. When I went to fetch the score of this composition from Ilibanek, who had it stored among the archives of the conservatoire, he warned me somewhat dryly, though not without kindness, of the danger of presenting this work to the Parisian public, as, to use his own words, it was too vague. One great objection was the difficulty of finding capable musicians for the six cornets required, as the music for this instrument, so skillfully played in Germany, could hardly, if ever, be satisfactorily executed in Paris. Herr Schlitz, the corrector of my suites for cornet a piston, offered his assistance. I was compelled to reduce my six cornets to four, and he told me that only two of these could be relied on. As a matter of fact, the attempts made at the rehearsal to produce those very passages on which the effect of my work chiefly depended were very discouraging. Not once were the soft high notes played, but they were flat or altogether wrong. In addition to this, as I was not going to be allowed to conduct the work myself, I had to rely upon a conductor who, as I was well aware, had fully convinced himself that my composition was the most utter rubbish, an opinion that seemed to be shared by the whole orchestra. Berlioz, who was present at the rehearsal, remained silent throughout. He gave me no encouragement, though he did not dissuade me. He merely said afterwards, with a weary smile, that it was very difficult to get on in Paris. On the night of the performance, February 4, 1841, the audience, which was largely composed of subscribers to the Gazette Musicale, and to whom, therefore, my literary successes were not unknown, seemed rather favorably disposed towards me. I was told later on that my overture, however wearisome it had been, would certainly have been applauded if those unfortunate cornet players, by continually failing to produce the effective passages, had not excited the public almost to the point of hostility. For Parisians, for the most part, care only for the skillful parts of performances, as, for instance, for the faultless production of difficult tones. I was clearly conscious of my complete failure. After this misfortune Paris no longer existed for me, and all I had to do was to go back to my miserable bedroom and resume my work of arranging Donizetti's operas. So great was my renunciation of the world that, like a penitent, I no longer shaved, and to my wife's annoyance, 
for the first and only time in my life allowed my beard to grow quite long. I tried to bear everything patiently, and the only thing that threatened really to drive me to despair was a pianist in the room adjoining ours who during the livelong day practiced Liszt's fantasy on Lucia D. Lammermoor. I had to put a stop to this torture, so, to give him an idea of what he made us endure, one day I moved our own piano which was terribly out of tune close up to the party wall. Then Bricks with his piccolo flute played the piano and violin, or flute, arrangement of the Favorita overture I had just completed, while I accompanied him on the piano. The effect on our neighbor, a young piano teacher, must have been appalling. The concierge told me the next day that the poor fellow was leaving, and, after all, I felt rather sorry. The wife of our concierge had entered into a sort of arrangement with us. At first we had occasionally availed ourselves of her services, especially in the kitchen, also for brushing clothes, cleaning boots, and so on. But even the slight outlay that this involved was eventually too heavy for us, and after having dispensed with her services, Minna had to suffer the humiliation of doing the whole work of the household, even the most menial part of it, herself. As we did not like to mention this to Bricks, Minna was obliged, not only to do all the cooking and washing up, but even to clean our lodger's boots as well. What we felt most, however, was the thought of what the concierge and his wife would think of us. But we were mistaken, for they only respected us the more, though of course we could not avoid a little familiarity at times, now and then, therefore, the man would have a chat with me on politics. When the quadruple alliance against France had been concluded, and the situation en dehors tiers ministry was regarded à very critical, My concierge trier tout réassuré me one des baïséignes. Monsieur, il y a quatre hommes en Europe qui s'appellent le roi Louis-Philippe, l'empereur d'Autriche, l'empereur de Russie, le roi de Prusse. Eh bien, ces quatre sont décès, et nous n'aurons pas la guerre. Of an evening, I very seldom lacked entertainment. But the few faithful friends who came to see me had to put up with my going on scribbling music till late in the night. Once they prepared a touching surprise for me in the form of a little party which they arranged for New Year's Eve, 1840. Lairs arrived at dusk, rang the bell, and brought a leg of veal. Keats brought some rum, sugar, and a lemon. Peck supplied a goose and Anders two bottles of the champagne with which he had been presented by a musical instrument maker in return for a flattering article he had written about his pianos. Bottles from that stock were produced only on very great occasions. I soon threw the confounded favorita aside, therefore, and entered enthusiastically into the fun. We all had to assist in the preparations, to light the fire in the salon, give a hand to my wife in the kitchen, and get what was wanted from the grocer. The supper developed into a dithyrambic orgy. When the champagne was drunk and the punch began to produce its effects, I delivered a fiery speech which so provoked the hilarity of the company that it seemed as though it would never end. I became so excited that I first mounted a chair, and then, by way of heightening the effect, at last stood on the table, thence to preach the maddest gospel of the contempt of life together with a eulogy on the South American free states. My charmed listeners eventually broke into such fits of sobs and laughter, and were so overcome that we had to give them all shelter for the night their condition making it impossible for them to reach their own homes in safety. On New Year's Day, 1841, I was again busy with my favorita. I remember another similar though far less boisterous feast, on the occasion of a visit paid us by the famous violinist Viewtemps, 
an old school fellow of Keats's. We had the great pleasure of hearing the young virtuoso, who was then greatly faded, in Paris, play to us charmingly for a whole evening, a performance which lent my little salon an unusual touch of fashion. Keats rewarded him for his kindness by carrying him on his shoulders to his hotel close by. We were hard hit in the early part of this year by a mistake I made owing to my ignorance of Paris customs. It seemed to us quite a matter of course that we should wait until the proper quarter day to give notice to our landlady. So I called on the proprietress of the house a rich young widow living in one of her own houses in the Marias Quarter. She received me but seemed much embarrassed and said she would speak to her agent about the matter and eventually referred me to him. The next day I was informed by letter that my notice would have been valid had it been given two days earlier. By this omission I had rendered myself liable according to the agreement, for another year's rent. Horrified by this news, I went to see the agent himself, and after having been kept waiting for a long time, as a matter of fact they would not let me in at all, I found an elderly gentleman, apparently crippled by some very painful malady, lying motionless before me. I frankly told him my position and begged him most earnestly to release me from my agreement, but I was merely told that the fault was mine, and not his that I had given notice a day too late, and consequently that I must find the rent for the next year. My concierge, to whom, with some emotion, I related the story of this occurrence, tried to soothe me. By saying, j'aurais pu vous dire cela, car voyez, monsieur, cet homme ne vaut pas l'eau qu'il boit. This entirely unforeseen misfortune destroyed our last hopes of getting out of our disastrous position. We consoled ourselves for a while with the hope of finding another lodger, but the fates were once more against us. Easter came, the new term began, and our prospects were as hopeless as ever. At last our concierge recommended us to a family who were willing to take the whole of our apartment, furniture included, off our hands for a few months. We gladly accepted this offer, for, at any rate, it ensured the payment of the rent for the ensuing quarter. We thought if only we could get away from this unfortunate place we should find some way of getting rid of it altogether. We therefore decided to find a cheap summer residence for ourselves in the outskirts of Paris. Mutin had been mentioned to us as an inexpensive summer resort, and we selected an apartment in the avenue which joins Mutin to the neighboring village of Bellevue. We left full authority with our concierge as to our rooms in Rue du Helder and settled down in our new temporary abode as well as we could. Old Bricks, the good-natured flutist, had to stay with us again. For, owing to the fact that his usual receipts had been delayed, he would have been in great straits had we refused to give him shelter. The removal of our scanty possessions took place on the 29th of April, and was, after all, no more than a flight from the impossible into the unknown. For how we were going to live during the following summer we had not the faintest idea. Schlesinger had no work for me, and no other sources were available. The only help we could hope for seemed to lie in journalistic work which, though rather unremunerative, had indeed given me the opportunity of making a little success. During the previous winter I had written a long article on Weber's Freischutz for the Gazette Musicale. This was intended to prepare the way for the forthcoming first performance of this opera, after recitatives from the pen of Berlioz had been added to it. 
The latter was apparently far from pleased at my article. In the article, I could not help referring to Berlioz's absurd idea of polishing up this old-fashioned musical work by adding ingredients that spoiled its original characteristics, merely in order to give it an appearance suited to the luxurious repertoire of Opera House. The fact that the result fully justified my forecasts did not in the least tend to diminish the ill feeling I had roused among all those concerned in the production. But I had the satisfaction of hearing that the famous George Sand had noticed my article. She commenced the introduction to a legendary story of French provincial life by repudiating certain doubts as to the ability of the French people to understand the mystic, fabulous element which, as I had shown, was displayed in such a masterly manner in Freischutz, and she pointed to my article as clearly explaining the characteristics of that opera. Another journalistic opportunity arose out of my endeavors to secure the acceptance of my Rienzi by the court theater at Dresden. Her Winkler, the secretary of that theater, whom I have already mentioned, regularly reported progress. But as editor of the Abendzeitung, a paper then rather on the wane, he seized the opportunity presented by our negotiations in order to ask me to send him frequent and gratuitous contributions. The consequence was that whenever I wanted to know anything concerning the fate of my opera, I had to oblige him by enclosing an article for his paper. Now, as these negotiations with the court theater lasted a very long time, and involved a large number of contributions from me, I often got into the most extraordinary fixes simply owing to the fact that I was now once more a prisoner in my room, and had been so for some time, and therefore knew nothing of what was going on in Paris. I had serious reasons for thus withdrawing from the artistic and social life of Paris. My own painful experiences and my disgust at all the mockery of that kind of life, once so attractive to me and yet so alien to my education, had quickly driven me away from everything connected with it. It is true that the production of the Huguenots, for instance, which I then heard for the first time, dazzled me very much. Indeed, its beautiful orchestral execution, and the extremely careful and effective mice and scene gave me a grand idea of the great possibilities of such perfect and definite artistic means. But, strange to say, I never felt inclined to hear the same opera again. I soon became tired of the extravagant execution of the vocalists, and I often amused my friends exceedingly by imitating the latest Parisian methods and the vulgar exaggerations with which the performances teemed. Those composers, moreover, who aimed at achieving success by adopting the style which was then in vogue, could not help either incurring my sarcastic criticism. The last shred of esteem which I still tried to retain for the first lyrical theater in the world was at last rudely destroyed when I saw how such an empty, altogether unfrench work as Donizetti's Favorita could secure so long and important a run at this theater. During the whole time of my stay in Paris, I do not think I went to the opera more than four times. The cold productions at the Opera Comique and the degenerate quality of the music produced there had repelled me from the start, and the same lack of enthusiasm displayed by the singers also drove me from Italian opera. The names, often very famous ones, of these artists who sang the same four operas for years could not compensate me for the complete absence of sentiment which characterized their performance so unlike that of Schroeder de Vriant, which I so thoroughly enjoyed. I clearly saw that everything was on the downgrade, and yet I cherished no hope or desire to see the state of decline superseded by a period of newer and fresher life.
I preferred the small theaters where French talent was shown in its true light. And yet, as the result of my own longings, I was too intent upon finding points of relationship in them which would excite my sympathy for it to be possible for me to realize those peculiar excellences in them which did not happen to interest me at all. Besides, from the very beginning my own troubles had proved so trying, and the consciousness of the failure of my Paris schemes had become so cruelly apparent, that either out of indifference or annoyance, I declined all invitations to the theaters. Again and again, much to Minna's regret, I returned tickets for performances in which Rachel was to appear at the Théâtre Francais, and, in fact, saw that famous theater only once when, some time later, I had to go there on business for my Dresden patron, who wanted some more articles. I adopted the most shameful means for filling the columns of the Abend Zeitung. I just strung together whatever I happened to hear in the evening from Anders and Lairs. But as they had no very exciting adventures either, they simply told me all they had picked up from papers and table talk, and this I tried to render with as much piquancy as possible in accordance with the journalistic style created by Heine, which was all the rage at the time. My one fear was lest old Hofrath Winkler should some day discover the secret of my wide knowledge of Paris. Among other things which I sent to his declining paper was a long account of the production of Freischutz. He was particularly interested in it, as he was the guardian of Weber's children, and when in one of his letters he assured me that he would not rest until he had got the definite assurance that Rienzi had been accepted, I sent him, with my most profuse thanks, the German manuscript of my Beethoven story for his paper. The 1841 edition of this Gazette, then published by Arnold, but now no longer in existence, contains the only print of this manuscript. My occasional journalistic work was increased by a request from Lewald, the editor of Europa, a literary monthly, asking me to write something for him. This man was the first who, from time to time, had mentioned my name to the public. As he used to publish musical supplements to his elegant and rather widely read magazine, I sent him two of my compositions from Königsberg for publication. One of these was the music I had set to a melancholy poem by Stuerlin, entitled Der Nabe Uendi der Tannenbaum, a work of which even today I am still proud, and my beautiful carnivals lied out of Liebesverbit. When I wanted to publish my little French compositions, Doors, Mon and Font, and the music to Hugo's Attente and Ronsard's Mignon, Lewald not only sent me a small fee, the first I had ever received for a composition, but commissioned some long articles on my Paris impressions, which he begged me to write as entertainingly as possible. For his paper I wrote Pariser Amusements and Pariser Fatalitaten, in which I gave vent in a humorous style, a la Heine, to all my disappointing experiences in Paris, and to all my contempt for the life led by its inhabitants. In the second I described the existence of a certain Hermann Fau, a strange good-for-nothing with whom, during my early Leipzig days, I had become more intimately acquainted than was desirable. This man had been wandering about Paris like a vagrant ever since the beginning of the previous winter, and the meager income one derived from arrangements of La Favorita was often partly consumed in helping this completely broken-down fellow. So it was only fair that I should get back a few francs of the money spent on him in Paris by turning his adventures to some account in Lewald's newspapers. When I came into contact with Leon Pillet, the manager of the opera, my literary work took yet another direction. After numerous inquiries, I eventually discovered that he had taken a fancy to my draft of the Fliegender Hollander. 
He informed me of this and asked me to sell him the plot, as he was under contract to supply various composers with subjects for operettas. I tried to explain to Pillet, both verbally and in writing, that he could hardly expect that the plot would be properly treated except by myself, as this draft was in fact my own idea, and that it had only come to his knowledge by my having submitted it to him. But it was all to no purpose. He was obliged to admit quite frankly that the expectations I had cherished as to the result of Meyerbeer's recommendation to him would not come to anything. He said there was no likelihood of my getting a commission for a composition, even of a light opera, for the next seven years, as his already existing contracts extended over that period. He asked me to be sensible and to sell him the draft for a small amount, so that he might have the music written by an author to be selected by him. And he added that if I still wished to try my luck at the opera house, I had better see the ballet master, as he might want some music for a certain dance. Seeing that I contemptuously refused this proposal, he left me to my own devices. After endless and unsuccessful attempts at getting the matter settled, I at last begged Edouard Manet, the commissaire for the Royal Theatres, who was not only a friend of mine but also editor of the Gazette Musicale, to act as mediator. He candidly confessed that he could not understand Pillet's liking for my plot, which he also was acquainted with. But as Pillet seemed to like it, though he would probably lose it, he advised me to accept anything for it, as Monsieur Paul Fauché, a brother-in-law of Victor Hugo's, had had an offer to work out the scheme for a similar libretto. This gentleman had, moreover, declared that there was nothing new in my plot, as the story of the Viso Phantom was well known in France. I now saw how I stood, and, in a conversation with Pillet, at which M. Fauché was present, I said I would come to an arrangement. My plot was generously estimated by Pillet at 500 francs, and I received that amount from the cash office at the theater, to be subsequently deducted from the author's rights of the future poet. Our summer residence in the Avenue de Mutin now assumed quite a definite character. These 500 francs had to help me to work out the words and music of my Fliegender Hollander for Germany, while I abandoned the French Viso, phantom to its fate. The state of my affairs, which was getting ever worse and worse, was slightly improved by the settlement of this matter. May and June had gone by, and during these months our troubles had grown steadily more serious. The lovely season of the year, the stimulating country air, and the sensation of freedom following upon my deliverance from the wretchedly paid musical hackwork I had had to do all the winter, wrought their beneficial effects on me, and I was inspired to write a small story entitled Ein Glücklicher Abend. This was translated and published in French in the Gazette Musicale. Soon, however, our lack of funds began to make itself felt with a severity that was very discouraging. We felt this all the more keenly when my sister Cecilia and her husband, following our example, moved to a place quite close to us. Though not wealthy, they were fairly well-to-do. They came to see us every day, but we never thought it desirable to let them know how terribly hard up we were. One day it came to a climax. Being absolutely without money, I started out early one morning to walk to Paris, for I had not even enough to pay the railway fare thither, and I resolved to wander about the whole day, trudging from street to street even until late in the afternoon, in the hope of raising a five-franc piece. But my errand proved absolutely vain, 
and I had to walk all the way back to Mutin again, utterly penniless. When I told Minna, who came to meet me, of my failure, she informed me in despair that Hermann Fau, whom I have mentioned before, had also come to us in the most pitiful plight, and actually in want of food, and that she had had to give him the last of the bread delivered by the baker that morning. The only hope that now remained was that, at any rate, my lodger Bricks, who by a singular fate was now our companion in misfortune, would return with some success from the expedition to Paris which he also had made that morning. At last he, too, returned bathed in perspiration and exhausted, driven home by the craving for a meal, which he had been unable to procure in the town, as he could not find any of the acquaintances he went to see. He begged most piteously for a piece of bread. This climax to the Situation at last inspired my wife with heroic resolution, for she felt it her duty to exert herself to appease at least the hunger of her menfolk. For the first time during her stay on French soil, she persuaded the baker, the butcher, and wine merchant, by plausible arguments, to supply her with the necessaries of life without immediate cash payment and Minna's eyes beamed when, an hour later, she was able to put before us an excellent meal, during which, as it happened, we were surprised by the Avenarius family, who were evidently relieved at finding us so well provided for. This extreme distress was relieved for a time, at the beginning of July, by the sale of my Viso Phantom which meant my final renunciation of my success in Paris. As long as the 500 francs lasted, I had an interval of respite for carrying on my work. The first object on which I spent my money was on the hire of a piano, a thing of which I had been entirely deprived for months. My chief intention in so Doing was to revive my faith in myself as a musician, as ever since the autumn of the previous year, I had exercised my talents as a journalist and adapter of operas only. The libretto of the Fliegender Hollander, which I had hurriedly written during the recent period of distress, aroused considerable interest in Lairs. He actually declared I would never write anything better and that the Fliegender Hollander would be my Don Juan. The only thing now was to find the music for it. As towards the end of the previous winter, I still entertained the hopes of being permitted to treat this subject for the French opera. I had already finished some of the words and music of the lyric parts, and had had the libretto translated by Emile de Cham, intending it for a trial performance, which, alas, never took place. These parts were the Ballad of Senta, the Song of the Norwegian Sailors, and the Spectre Song of the Crew of the Fliegender Hollander. Since that time I had been so violently torn away from the music that, when the piano arrived at my rustic retreat, I did not dare to touch it for a whole day. I was terribly afraid lest I should discover that my inspiration had left me, when suddenly I was seized with the idea that I had forgotten to write out the song of the helmsman in the first act, although, as a matter of fact, I could not remember having composed it at all, as I had in reality only just written the lyrics. I succeeded and was pleased with the result. The same thing occurred with the spinner's song. And when I had written out these two pieces, and, on further reflection, could not help admitting that they had really only taken shape in my mind, at that moment, I was quite delirious with joy at the discovery. In seven weeks, the whole of the music of the Fliegender Hollander, except the orchestration, was finished. Thereupon followed a general revival in our circle. My exuberant good spirits astonished everyone, and my avenarious relations in particular thought I must really be prospering, 
as I was such good company. I resumed my long walks in the woods of Mutin, frequently even consenting to help Minna gather mushrooms, which, unfortunately, were for her the chief charm of our woodland retreat, though it filled our landlord with terror when he saw us returning with our spoils, as he felt sure we should be poisoned if we ate them. My destiny, which almost invariably led me into strange adventures, here once more introduced me to the most eccentric character to be found not only in the neighborhood of Mutin, but even in Paris. This was M. Jaden who, though he was old enough to be able to say that he remembered seeing Madame de Pompadour, at Versailles was still vigorous beyond belief. It appeared to be his aim to keep the world in a constant state of conjecture as to his real age. He made everything for himself with his own hands, including even a quantity of wigs of every shade, ranging in the most comic variety from youthful flaxen to the most venerable white, with intermediate shades of gray. These he wore alternately as the fancy pleased him. He dabbled in everything and I was pleased to find he had a particular fancy for painting. The fact that all the walls of his rooms were hung with the most childish caricatures of animal life, and that he had even embellished the outside of his blinds with the most ridiculous paintings, did not disconcert me in the least. On the contrary, it confirmed my belief that he did not dabble in music until, to my horror, I discovered that the strangely discordant sounds of a harp which kept reaching my ears from some unknown region were actually proceeding from his basement, where he had two harpsichords of his own invention. He informed me that he had unfortunately neglected playing them for a long time, but that he now meant to begin practicing again assiduously in order to give me pleasure. I succeeded in dissuading him from this by assuring him that the doctor had forbidden me to listen to the harp, as it was bad for my nerves. His figure as I saw him for the last time remains impressed on my memory, like an apparition from the world of Hoffman's fairy tales. In the late autumn, when we were going back to Paris, he asked us to take with us on our furniture van an enormous stovepipe, of which he promised to relieve us shortly. One very cold day Jaden actually presented himself at our new abode in Paris, in a most preposterous costume of his own manufacture, consisting of very thin light yellow trousers, a very short pale green dress coat with conspicuously long tails, projecting lace shirt frills and cuffs, a very fair wig, and a hat so small that it was constantly dropping off. He wore in addition a quantity of imitation jewelry, and all this on the undisguised assumption that he could not go about in fashionable Paris dressed as simply as in the country. He had come for the stovepipe. We asked him where the men to carry it were. In reply, he simply smiled and expressed his surprise at our helplessness, and thereupon took the enormous stovepipe under his arm and absolutely refused to accept our help when we offered to assist him in carrying it down the stairs. Though this operation, notwithstanding his vaunted skill, occupied him quite half an hour. Everyone in the house assembled to witness this removal, but he was by no means disconcerted and managed to get the pipe through the street door and then tripped gracefully along the pavement with it and disappeared from our sight. For this short though eventful period, during which I was quite free to give full scope to my inmost thoughts, I indulged in the consolation of purely artistic creations. I can only say that, when it came to an end, I had made such progress that I could look forward with cheerful composure to the much longer period of trouble and distress I felt was in store for me. This, in fact, duly set in, 
for I had only just completed the last scene when I found that my 500 francs were coming to an end, and what was left was not sufficient to secure me the necessary peace and freedom from worry for composing the overture. I had to postpone this until my luck should take another favorable turn, and meanwhile I was forced to engage in the struggle for a bare subsistence, making efforts of all kinds that left me neither leisure nor peace of mind. The concierge from the Rue du Helder brought us the news that the mysterious family to whom we had let our rooms had left, and that we were now once more responsible for the rent. I had to tell him that I would not under any circumstances trouble about the rooms any more, and that the landlord might recoup himself by the sale of the furniture we had left there. This was done at a very heavy loss, and the furniture, the greater part of which was still unpaid for, was sacrificed to pay the rent of a dwelling which we no longer occupied. Under the stress of the most terrible privations, I still endeavored to secure sufficient leisure for working out the orchestration of the score of the Fliegender Hollander. The rough autumn weather set in at an exceptionally early date. People were all leaving their country houses for Paris, and among them the Avenarius family. We, however, could not dream of doing so, for we could not even raise the funds for the journey. When M. Jaden expressed his surprise at this, I pretended to be so pressed with work that I could not interrupt it, although I felt the cold that penetrated through the thin walls of the house very severely. So I waited for help from Ernst Kastel, one of my old Königsberg friends, a well-to-do young merchant, who a short time before had called on us in Muden and treated us to a luxurious repast in Paris, promising at the same time to relieve our necessities as soon as possible by an advance, which we knew was an easy matter to him. By way of cheering us up, Keats came over to us one day, with a large portfolio and a pillow under his arm. He intended to amuse us by working at a large caricature representing myself and my unfortunate adventures in Paris, and the pillow was to enable him, after his labors, to get some rest on our hard couch, which he had noticed had no pillows at the head. Knowing that we had a difficulty in procuring fuel, he brought with him some bottles of rum to warm us with punch during the cold evenings. Under these circumstances I read Hoffman's tales to him and my wife. At last I had news from Königsberg, but it only opened my eyes to the fact that the gay young dog had not meant his promise seriously. We now looked forward almost with despair to the chilly mists of approaching winter, but Keats, declaring that it was his place to find help, packed up his portfolio placed it under his arm with the pillow, and went off to Paris. On the next day he returned with two hundred francs, that he had managed to procure by means of generous self-sacrifice. We at once set off for Paris, and took a small apartment near our friends, in the back part of number 14 Rue Jacob. I afterwards heard that shortly after we left it was occupied by Proudhon. We got back to town on October 30th. Our home was exceedingly small and cold, and its chilliness in particular made it very bad for our health. We furnished it scantily with the little we had saved from the wreck of the Rue du Holder, and awaited the results of my efforts towards getting my works accepted and produced in Germany. The first necessity was at all costs to secure peace and quietness for myself for the short time which I should have to devote to the overture of the Fliegender Hollander. I told Keats that he would have to procure the money necessary for my household expenses until this work was finished and the full score of the opera sent off. With the aid of a pedantic uncle, 
who had lived in Paris a long time and who was also a painter. He succeeded in providing me with the necessary assistance, in installments of five or ten francs at a time. During this period I often pointed with cheerful pride to my boots, which became mere travesties of footgear, as the soles eventually disappeared altogether. As long as I was engaged on the Dutchman, and Keats was looking after me, this made no difference, for I never went out. But when I had dispatched my completed score to the management of the Berlin Court Theatre at the beginning of December, the bitterness of the position could no longer be disguised. It was necessary for me to buckle to and look for help myself. What this meant in Paris I learned just about this time from the hapless fate of the worthy lairs. Driven by need such as I myself had had to surmount a year before at about the same time, he had been compelled on a broiling hot day in the previous summer to scour the various quarters of the city breathlessly, to get grace for bills he had accepted, and which had fallen due. He foolishly took an iced drink, which he hoped would refresh him in his distressing condition, but it immediately made him lose his voice, and from that day he was the victim of a hoarseness which with terrific rapidity ripened the seeds of consumption, doubtless latent in him, and developed that incurable disease. For months he had been growing weaker and weaker, filling us at last with the gloomiest anxiety. He alone believed the supposed chill would be cured if he could heat his room better for a time. One day I sought him out in his lodging, where I found him in the icy cold room, huddled up at his writing table and complaining of the difficulty of his work for Didot, which was all the more distressing as his employer was pressing him for advances he had made. He declared that if he had not had the consolation in those doleful hours of knowing that I had, at any rate, got my Dutchman finished, and that a prospect of success was thus open to the little circle of friends, his misery would have been hard indeed to bear. Despite my own great trouble, I begged him to share our fire and work in my room. He smiled at my courage in trying to help others, especially as my quarters offered barely space enough for myself and my wife. However, one evening he came to us and silently showed me a letter he had received from Vilmaine, the Minister of Education at that time, in which the latter expressed in the warmest terms his great regret at having only just learned that so distinguished a scholar, whose able and extensive collaboration in Didot's issue of the Greek classics had made him participator in a work that was the glory of the nation, should be in such bad health and straitened circumstances. Unfortunately, the amount of public money which he had at his disposal at that moment for subsidizing literature only allowed of his offering him the sum of 500 francs which he enclosed, with apologies asking him to accept it as a recognition of his merits on the part of the French government, and adding that it was his intention to give earnest consideration as to how he might materially improve his position. This filled us with the utmost thankfulness on poor Lair's account, and we looked on the incident almost as a miracle. We could not help assuming, however, that M. Vilmaine had been influenced by Didot, who had been prompted by his own guilty conscience for his despicable exploitation of Lairs, and by the prospect of thus relieving himself of the responsibility of helping him. At the same time, from similar cases within our knowledge, which were fully confirmed by my own subsequent experience, we were driven to the conclusion that such prompt and considerate sympathy on the part of a minister would have been impossible in Germany. Lairs would now have a fire to work by, but alas, our fears as to his declining health could not be allayed. 
When we left Paris in the following spring, it was the certainty that we should never see our dear friend again that made our parting so painful. In my own great distress, I was again exposed to the annoyance of having to write numerous unpaid articles for the Abend Zeitung, as my patron, Hofrath Winkler, was still unable to give me any satisfactory account of the fate of my Rienzi in Dresden. In these circumstances, I was obliged to consider it a good thing that Halevi's latest opera was at last a success. Schlesinger came to us radiant with joy at the success of La Reine de Schieper, and promised me eternal bliss for the piano score and various other arrangements I had made of this newest rage in the sphere of opera. So I was again forced to pay the penalty for composing my own Fliegender Hollander by having to sit down and write out arrangements of Halevi's opera. Yet this task no longer weighed on me so heavily. Apart from the well-founded hope of being at last recalled from my exile in Paris, and thus being able, as I thought, to regard this last struggle with poverty as the decisive one, the arrangement of Halevi's score was far and away a more interesting piece of hackwork than the shameful labor I had spent on Donizetti's Favorita. I paid another visit, the last for a long time to come, to the Grand Opera to hear this Reign de Schieper. There was, indeed, much for me to smile at. My eyes were no longer shut to the extreme weakness of this class of work, and the caricature of it that was often produced by the method of rendering it. I was sincerely rejoiced to see the better side of Halevi again. I had taken a great fancy to him from the time of his La Juve, and had a very high opinion of his masterly talent. At the request of Schlesinger, I also willingly consented to write for his paper a long article on Halevi's latest work. In it, I laid particular stress on my hope that the French school might not again allow the benefits obtained by studying the German style to be lost by relapsing into the shallowest Italian methods. On that occasion I ventured, by way of encouraging the French school, to point to the peculiar significance of Aubert, and particularly to his Stum von Portesai, drawing attention, on the other hand, to the overloaded melodies of Rossini, which often resembled soul F.A. exercises. In reading over the proof of my article, I saw that this passage about Rossini had been left out, and M. Edouard Manet admitted to me that, in his capacity as editor of a musical paper, he had felt himself bound to suppress it. He considered that if I had any adverse criticism to pass on the composer, I could easily get it published in any other kind of paper, but not in one devoted to the interests of music, simply because such a passage could not be printed there without seeming absurd. It also annoyed him that I had spoken in such high terms of Aubert, but he let it stand. I had to listen to much from that quarter which enlightened me forever with regard to the decay of operatic music in particular, and artistic taste in general, among Frenchmen of the present day. I also wrote a longer article on the same opera for my precious friend Winkler at Dresden, who was still hesitating about accepting my Rienzi. In doing so, I intentionally made merry over a mishap that had befallen Lachner the conductor. Kustner, who was theatrical director at Munich at the time, with a view to giving his friend another chance, ordered a libretto to be written for him by St. George's in Paris, so that, through his paternal care, the highest bliss which a German composer could dream of might be assured to his protege. Well, it turned out that when Halevi's Reign de Schieper appeared, it treated the same subject as Lachner's presumably original work, which had been composed in the meantime. It mattered very little that the libretto was a really good one. 
the value of the bargain lay in the fact that it was to be glorified by Lachner's music. It appeared, however, that St. George's had, as a matter of fact, to some extent altered the book sent to Munich, but only by the omission of several interesting features. The fury of the Munich manager was great, whereupon St. George's declared his astonishment that the latter could have imagined he would supply a libretto intended solely for the German stage at the paltry price offered by his German customer. As I had formed my own private opinion as to procuring French librettos for operas, and as nothing in the world would have, induced me to set to music even the most effective piece of writing by scribe or st. Georges, this occurrence delighted me immensely, and in the best of spirits I let myself go on the point for the benefit of the readers of the Abin Zeitung, who, it is to be hoped, did not include my future friend Lachner. In addition, my work on Halevi's opera Rain de Sheeper brought me into closer contact with that composer and was the means of procuring me many an enlivening talk with that peculiarly good-hearted and really unassuming man, whose talent, alas, declined all too soon. Schlesinger, in fact, was exasperated at his incorrigible laziness. Halevi, who had looked through my piano score, contemplated several changes with a view to making it easier, but he did not proceed with them. Schlesinger could not get the proof sheets back. The publication was consequently delayed, and he feared that the popularity of the opera would be over before the work was ready for the public. He urged me to get firm hold of Halevi very early in the morning in his rooms and compel him to set to work at the alterations in my company. The first time I reached his house at about ten in the morning, I found him just out of bed, and he informed me that he really must have breakfast first. I accepted his invitation and sat down with him to a somewhat luxurious meal. My conversation seemed to appeal to him, but friends came in, and at last Schlesinger among the number, who burst into a fury at not finding him at work on the proofs he regarded as so important. Halevi, however, remained quite unmoved. In the best of good tempers he merely complained of his latest success, because he had never had more peace than of late when his operas, almost without exception, had been failures, and he had not had anything to do with them after the first production. Moreover, he feigned not to understand why this Rain de Sheeper in particular should have been a success. He declared that Schlesinger had engineered it on purpose to worry him. When he spoke a few words to me in German, one of the visitors was astonished whereupon Schlesinger said that all Jews could speak German. Thereupon Schlesinger was asked if he also was a Jew. He answered that he had been, but had become a Christian for his wife's sake. This freedom of speech was a pleasant surprise to me, because in Germany in such cases we always studiously avoided the point, as discourteous to the person referred to. But as we never got to the proof correcting, Schlesinger made me promise to give Halevi no peace until we had done them. The secret of his indifference to success became clear to me in the course of further conversation, as I learned that he was on the point of making a wealthy marriage. At first I was inclined to think that Halevi was simply a man whose youthful talent was only stimulated to achieve one great success with the object of becoming rich. In his case, however, this was not the only reason, as he was very modest in regard to his own capacity, and had no great opinion of the works of those more fortunate composers who were writing for the French stage at that time. In him I thus, for the first time, met with the frankly expressed admission of disbelief in the value of all our modern creations in this dubious field of art. I have since come to the conclusion that this incredulity, 
often expressed with much less modesty, justifies the participation of all Jews in our artistic concerns. Only once did Halevi speak to me, with real candor, when, on my tardy departure for Germany, he wished me the success he thought my works deserved. In the year 1860, I saw him again. I had learned that, while the Parisian critics were giving vent to the bitterest condemnation of the concerts I was giving at that time, he had expressed his approval, and this determined me to visit him at the Palais de l Institute, of which he had for some time been permanent secretary. He seemed particularly eager to learn from my own lips what my new theory about music really was, of which he had heard such wild rumors. For his own part, he said, he had never found anything but music in my music, but with this difference that mine had generally seemed very good. This gave rise to a lively discussion on my part, to which he good-humoredly agreed once more wishing me success in Paris. This time, however, he did so with less conviction than when he bade me goodbye for Germany, which I thought was because he doubted whether I could succeed in Paris. From this final visit I carried away a depressing sense of the enervation, both moral and aesthetic, which had overcome one of the last great French musicians, while, on the other hand, I could not help feeling that a tendency to a hypocritical or frankly impudent exploitation of the universal degeneracy marked all who could be designated as Halevi's successors. Throughout this period of constant hackwork my thoughts were entirely bent on. My return to Germany, which now presented itself to my mind in a wholly new and ideal light, I endeavored in various ways to secure all that seemed most attractive about the project, or which filled my soul with longing. My intercourse with Lairs had, on the whole, given a decided spur to my former tendency to grapple seriously with my subjects, a tendency which had been counteracted by closer contact with the theater. This desire now furnished a basis for closer study of philosophical questions. I had been astonished at times to hear even the grave and virtuous layers, openly and quite as a matter of course, give expression to grave doubts concerning our individual survival after death. He declared that in many great men this doubt, even though only tacitly held, had been the real incitement to noble deeds. The natural result of such a belief speedily dawned on me without, however, causing me any serious alarm. On the contrary, I found a fascinating stimulus in the fact that boundless regions of meditation and knowledge were thereby opened up which, hitherto I had merely skimmed in light-hearted levity.